welcome. Thank You've you. come out on this evening to <laughs> to see us in our lovely uh, mandala yeah. clad. We could be anywhere room. in the world. <laughs> we could be. We could be. Yeah, and we're uh, yeah. we're just round the corner from each other, which is good. Yeah. yeah. So, well. I don't know where to start really with your career. Um, I suppose um, begin at the beginning really. I mean, you're a pianist, aren't you? Originally, you're a keyboard player, is that right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's how I started. Yeah, I started really young. Um, I played the guitar first at school, like everyone does, you know. Um, I went to a school called St. Wilfrid's in Liverlands because I'm from the, the north end of Liverpool. Right. The proper um, scousers. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're like the Liverpool of Liverpool. Like all the other scousers kick, kick us up the arse, you know what right. I mean? So it's a bit like, it's like Kerry and Ireland, you know, it's, yeah. it's the same sort of thing. But uh, no, it was great. I was really lucky because it was a, a fantastic school, you know. And um, so I played the guitar. Actually, I started when I was in juniors. And then I was in the school orchestra uh, on the trumpet, which I was rubbish at. Right. But me and my mate Keith O'Neill, who's now who has been for a long time the drummer in cast, and he's, he's a fantastic manager as well. <laughs> we were like the two trumpeters in the school wow. orchestra. You know? um, so yeah, I did that, and then we were in a band. It was like the first kind of like an indie band. I was in called the Empty Hours, and I was I was on keyboards for that. He was on drums, and it was very sort of it was that sound. That like five or six years later became massive. Do you know right. what I mean? There's really sort of so when classic was this years wise. This would be eighty five, I think, or maybe even eighty four. I did my O levels in eighty four. Right, so I was born right. in sixty eight. Um, so it was sixth form kind right. of time. Um, yeah, and then I, I was kind of out of the traps then, you know. And I, I played, I, I kind of quite early on. I, I joined. I was in a band called uh, Junction Twenty One. And I played in London. I did the Moon Fiddler in Harleston and the Half Moon in Putney. And I was only about 18. And that wow. was scary stuff. I know the Half Moon. I don't know the other yeah, one. Yeah. One thing I've found over the years being the keyboard player in bands is the snobbishness, really. It's rubbish. And it just goes over the years. It's like you're not considered unless oh. you play guitar. And oh, it, tell me about it. it. It's been a strange tell one. Tell me about it. But it's go, it goes through cycles, doesn't it? You know, you sort of, you, you're you a fashionable fashionable for a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And then you're a pariah. And then it's like somebody will bring a record out and then they'll want you to do it again. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was one of the more ridiculous things you could be, which is a keyboard player in the 80s who didn't like synthesizers. Right. So not a tremendous amount of work around. Especially what you could not see in there. Liverpool with the yeah. whole fucking thing they had going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was I was a big fan of Kate Bush. Um, I what really got me into playing the piano was Hunky Dory. I mm. just never heard anything like it. You know, not yeah. just Life on Mars, but the piano when the piano comes in on Quicksand or any of those songs. I was just yeah. like, oh my god, this is incredible. And it's you know? recorded so nicely as well, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds great. Yeah, and that piano is an interesting sort of sideline. Um, that piano is a, a very famous instrument in its own right because it's the piano that was on Hey Jude, so that made everyone kind of want to play it. Right. But because obviously Rick Wakeman is so amazing, you know, and, and Hunky Dory was a unique thing that it was like the whole album is based around the piano and Bowie's yeah. on, on record as, as I've said that many times, you know. He didn't want Mick Ronson weirdly to be he wanted Mick Ronson and Rick Wakeman almost sparring against each other. So you get this album yeah. that in any other hands would have been a guitar album and it's actually like a piano album, you know. It's such a good album. It's incredible. It's, it? it's, it's Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, it's up there with Pet Sounds or, or yeah. uh, any of them, you know. So that piano it's on Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. It's on Morning Is Broken. Uh, it's on The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. Wow. It's kind of a piano that is, it's also the piano on Bohemian Rhapsody. Is it still alive? So, that piano. It's. It was. I think this would make a fascinating documentary. Is to is to trace that piano around. It was so. It's not Mrs. Mills, is it? The piano because she had a piano they named after her at Abbey Road. Oh right. You remember Mrs. Mills? No, no. It was. It was a Trident. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It wasn't at Abbey Road. Right, weirdly, right, yeah. Right. It, it, it was a Trident. And I remember when one of the first when I started doing sessions at Amazon Studios, which was out in Simon's Wood, which became Par Street when I moved into Liverpool, they had a Steinway piano there, which right. which went um, to Par Street. And the engineers said they they tried to do the same thing. They'd had the chassis moved so it would get this slightly more rocky, high end tinny sound to it, you know. Yeah. So I was anyway. I was just piano obsessed. Um, I was actually. I'm probably as as decent a guitar player. I don't play lead. I kind of pick and, and play a lot of acoustic. Yeah. But the thing I love more than anything, weirdly, is playing bass. Because yeah. I just really wow. feel comfortable 
on a bass and I feel like I found my instrument when I play bass. My timing's much tighter right. and everything. Right. But I didn't start that until 96 and that was a, a, by the time I was acting, you know, so that was in, yeah. a, in a theatre show. But yeah, it's so just going back. So we did, um, yeah, it, it was just kind of on that circuit until about, nine, I went to college in 1990 because what you were saying then is absolutely right. The worst thing to be when you're a keyboard player is in a studio because yeah. everyone else gets nine fucking years <laughs> to set up yeah. and do their stuff. And then someone will come over and go, um, can you simulate a symphony orchestra, Hammond organ, uh, grand piano, and 10 other things, and uh, we finish in 20 minutes? Yeah. And I just thought, oh, I've just had enough of this. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> So you went into acting. You went back to college to do acting in 1990. Yeah. 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 I went to, it was... It's now Liverpool Hope. It was Liverpool Institute of Higher Education then. Because I'd still at school, I'd massively got into literature and stuff. I mean, I read this short story by Doris Lessing called Out of the Fountain, and I never thought anything could hit me in the way that music had done. Do you know what I mean? I thought that was that was it. That's what you're going to do for the rest of your life. And I read this story. I can remember exactly where I was. I was in, well, I was in the library. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I, I just like I felt like I was almost going into a faint or something. I, I loved it, you know. And and round about that time, um, this is even almost pre VHS. You know what I mean? You'd watch what was on the telly, yeah. and I saw about three films within two weeks, all of which have remained firm favourites. One was Equus, uh, right. which is a work of absolute genius. Yeah. The Entertainer, uh, oh. and that was the first time I'd seen Olivier, and yeah. and again seeing him. You know, I, I felt like, you know, when you see like that effect that used to be used when a, a cinema screen sort of pops and goes on fire yeah. from, from behind and it goes, yeah, yeah. goes black and all that. I felt when I was watching him that something like that was happening. It was like he was just coming out of. He's amazing. Screen. He is that, amazing. Yeah. 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 I, I've done if you've ever seen it. Have you ever seen the uh, Max Wall version of The Entertainer? No. no. And um, apparently, you know, you know, you see these eyes. I'm, I'm dead behind these oh, eyes great line, when he yeah. does that line. Yeah. Um, and apparently, when when Wall did it, it was just fucking the earth stopped mm. because by the time he performed the the uh, entertainer, um, you know, he'd gone through so much and been through so much in life. Have you read his autobiography? No, Fool, no. You, you borrow I'd, it if you yeah, want. I'd love to. Yeah. Fool on the Hill. It's right. fucking fantastic. Um, but yeah, that's such a good film. Just anyway, isn't it? Yeah, it's just yeah. so well done. And he is a he is an asshole, though. I mean, Archie, <laughs> isn't he? Oh, I, I, I right, was trying yeah. to con. Uh, yeah, Thora Heard and her husband out of money to get the daughter into a show and all that. And obviously, what he's trying to get from the daughter well, as well. You know? Yeah, yeah. But it is it is such a an examination of that sort of middle aged male psyche, really. And then his dad's better than him still. Yeah. Even though he's old and everything. Yeah, and that was uh, Roger Livesey, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. Film? Yeah. No yeah. relation. Right. But but um, yeah, I can imagine that that had a profound effect on me. Well, I think um, wasn't that a Woodfall film? Was it a Woodfall? I, it's I Tony don't Richardson, know. It's so, yeah, so, I know it's Tony Richardson. It's, it's in that vein. If it's not a Woodfall, then it's in that vein yeah. of Saturday Night, Sunday Morning, Long yeah. Distance, Long Distance Runner, yeah. and, and all that. And yeah, those films when I was younger when I saw them especially Saturday night Sunday morning mm. you know when it, he sort of, he's counting the bolts in the rally factory 550 bloody five and I'll, I'll have a fag in a minute and all that that anti-hero of Arthur Seaton and, and it does lead you down paths of like Alan Silito and John Osborne and all these other writers absolutely, doesn't absolutely, it absolutely yeah well the other thing that people said about Olivier was that he couldn't play the little man you know he was great as like an emperor mm. or a king and, and Archie Rice in his own way is, is a huge character but I think that's bollocks, personally, because um, I, I managed to get, only a couple of weeks ago, I've been trying to get this film again for a very, very long time. There's a film called Term of Trial, where he plays a school teacher who is accused of improper behaviour. Now, this is, this is in the 1960s, so that subject was way taboo yeah. back then. And he is just a comprehensive school teacher, and right. he, he's utterly incredible. And I would never be so deluded as to think, I want to be like that. I just suddenly became aware that there was just another world that was as brilliant yeah. and, and was there yeah. and that you could go and watch a play which I still do to this day mm -hmm. you know and just get completely transported you know yeah 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 it's a funny one though insofar as I don't know if this applies to you but the way I was at school I always wanted to do drama but I didn't really have the bollocks to do it so I sort of did music as a sort of one foot in each camp 
thing really and then as I got older it sort of becomes this thing that you have no option over it's like well if I don't try this I'll never know and so that's why I started doing more acting mm. simply because I suppose you get older and you get more confidence or it's a combination of more confidence and you deciding what the fucking hell <laughs> yeah. I better have a go at this yeah yeah well it wasn't an option at school unfortunately uh, no believe it or not was music because I, I was a bit of a test case one of the reasons why I ended up going down this route was I got 98% in my music O level but nowhere in my local authority was music A level on offer right. and it, I got a place at Mabel Fletcher College um, and they said, oh, this is this is straightforward, don't worry about it, you get a thing called a transfer permit, because Mabel Fletcher College was in Liverpool. If I'd been dodgy, I'd have just put a false address down and all that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, but, and they said, it'll, you know, they'd never get contested, see you in September kind of thing. And I remember getting this letter saying, no, 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 we don't award transfer permits for either music or drama, mm. which was ridiculous because they didn't do drama anyway. Went back, my school teaching me music teacher wrote me this amazing letter you know and it was as i say it was a bit of a test case it was an appeal that went to a very very high level but I, uh, that was the end of my ability to be formally educated in music right and it re at 16 that was a, a, a blow and a half oh yeah you know? yeah um uh, so yeah I, I i i played in bands and stuff but i, I wanted to played the Philharmonic Hall or something like that. It was another route that I'd, I'd wanted to go down. My dad was really into orchestral music. You know, Alexi Sale writes brilliantly in his biography about this culture of, you know, my dad worked on the docks, his dad worked on, on the trains and stuff. You know, that the, this idea that working class people gravitate towards working class culture is nonsense. Mm -hmm. It's a, Everyone has a mixture of everything, mm -hmm. you know. So, I, I mean, I'm not really a, a big fan of things like light opera, but my father was, so I was always around that. I could always hear other yeah. instruments not like rock and roll instruments you know um and i just assumed that if you were good and you were keen you yeah. could do that and it, it, yeah. it's, but i don't regret it because obviously that was one of the reasons that i went to college and and i i've actually done far more work as an actor in terms of paid work hour by hour and all that probably than as a musician you know yeah i think that's a pretty fair assessment i mean the music game has has really been I think that it's been ruined, and I, I say this in the nicest possible way, but I think it's been ruined by musicians. And I say that because they've been too keen to play for nothing or, or, or agree. whatever it is. Yeah. And so it's sort of, there's that tug of war be between wanting to play and then being exploited. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I don't think that's happened as much in acting. Maybe that'll change, it, but, but certainly I still think at this moment in time, if an actor is free or if they cost very little, there's a perception that they're not very good. Because it's one of those things that you can't just learn to play fucking whiskey in the jar on a guitar, you know. Well, you can learn to play yeah. a song on a yeah. guitar, but you can't You can't play like Jimi Hendrix. So if you just want someone to strum in the corner and warble through a few songs, you can get someone for free. But if you want someone to, to perform, it's, yeah. it's a whole different world and it's a whole different set of... I, I, I see if I do music right if I'm going doing a gig so if I'm singing playing piano whatever it is I don't really get nervous if it's an acting job I get really really right. nervous yeah so obviously there's there's more to lose and it's a different uh, vocabulary for, for me at any mm. rate so I don't particularly understand that but well, you, you're certainly right about the, the free thing and I, and I also find a lot of venue owners I find it very unedifying when they think no one notices that by throwing on an unpaid open mic night and getting 10 people to do it, those 10 people are not only buying drinks themselves, but bringing five people with yeah. them. So there's, there's your full room, yeah. you know. And they have the nerve to say that they're investing in local culture. They're not. They're getting no. people to work for nothing. And you try saying to a plumber, you know, uh, if, if, you know, I'll, I'll pay it in a couple of weeks or, you know, if things go well, I might be able to pay you in yeah. a year. And I was lucky in so far as I'm just about from that generation where that didn't happen. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I had a car when I went to college and stuff like that. You right. know, I, I earned a living as a musician. Um, I still gig now, you know, but um, oh God, I wouldn't want to be 21. No, in no. 2018, it was bad enough yeah. when I was doing it. You know, at that age, there was mm. it was still that that perception of, um, you know, oh well, you know, we're letting you play out. We were doing you a favour. You know, yeah. it's just like I mean, you speak to some of the old guys and that, and in the 70s they were playing, 
social clubs for 250 quid a night yeah you know what i mean oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. just out of this fucking world yeah, I mean, yeah, what does yeah. that translate to now oh God. two and a half grand yeah, or absolutely, something absolutely. I mean, but also you t- you know it, it, even at the higher echelons of the music business if you were just a bass player in a not particularly famous but signed band yeah you you would have to strip a bank manager in terms of your annual yeah. salary yeah. you know yeah and a lot of those guys did play the game quite cannily and they're now running yeah. or owning studios and stuff like that. Yeah. And that that's brilliant because you know it's that famous statistic isn't it that there was about a six year period where ABBA were making more money in tax returns for their government than Volvo <laughs> do you know what I mean get your yeah. head around that in yeah, terms yeah. of in terms of what you know what that unit is worth in terms of a commodity as opposed to a shirt or a pair yeah. of glasses or something yeah. it's amazing well I read an article a few years back that was saying that um People are complaining about how little musicians are making now, mainly musicians like me, um, and that you know they're no longer making the money like they made in the seventies and the sixties or the eighties or whatever and stuff like that. And this art- and this article quite accurately pointed out, I think that the situation in the seventies, eighties, sixties, whatever, that wasn't forever. Between the past and now, that was just a blip. And now we've gone back to musicians earning fuck all, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's gone back to how it was. Yeah, you know? and, yeah. and like I think that's a pretty good description of it. Mm. I think that now in this um, a really oversaturated market and a really different market that has now managed to have been manipulated to be even more controlled than it used to be. Because in many ways it's democratised now, isn't it? But at the same time, I don't know. I don't know why, but... Um, this this sort of internet boom has been they've managed to squeeze it and change it into their own cash cow like it used yeah. to be i guess the one of the few positives is that the live thing has really gone through the roof hasn't yeah. it you know not yeah. only just like big festivals and stuff but sadly a lot of musicians because they're not making the money off the sales of recorded music in the way they once did you know for example you've got like narina palo is doing studio 2 next month an artist of that sort of um you know, punching weight, if you like, never would have done a venue of that size 20 years ago. Yeah. And you're getting them now because they haven't to work all year round, yeah. which as an audience member is great. Yeah. The artists themselves are yeah. probably knackered, you know, yeah. or, or sick of playing the same set yeah. and everything. But at least it means if, if, if you're young and coming through, you have got a higher calibre of musician. Yeah. Of, of, you know, you don't have to necessarily go to the NEC or go to London or whatever, you know. Yeah. The, um, and as I say, the, the, the festival thing. It was an interesting, of, of all the people, a much maligned Phil Collins made a, a, a prediction a long time ago, which was he said that the the, the sort of um, MP3 thing will work in favour in the long run. He said, because what will happen is, after about six or seven years, you will get this generation of young listeners who've only ever heard a really crap sound. Yeah. They'll go to a gig and it will blow their minds and yeah. it'll be amazing. And he said, and at that point, big live gigs, like festival level gigs, will get bigger and bigger. And, and that's kind of happened. Yeah, yeah. The thing is, again, though, it's sort of very corporate, isn't it? I mean, the whole thing now seems to have been... I don't know, I'm sort of... I have a love-hate thing with this. I think that... The, the more live stuff there is and the more music there is just better anyway for society but at the same time you know when I've been speaking to people who did um, let's say they did Eric's in the 70s or they did Planet X or they did whatever it may be or if you think about Evis starting Glastonbury back in the day and that I'm not entirely certain that stuff like that at the moment is possible there'll be something comes along won't there I mean look how Cream came out of nowhere yeah, and, and, and dominate and now yeah. dominates the globe. But I say, you know, even your local band night is sponsored by Carlin, mm. and it's sort of again, like you say, getting people in for free. And the irony is, they're not finding anyone. If Hendrix were cutting his teeth now, would he get signed? Yeah. Or would you just have to do an open mic night somewhere and well, yeah. get a job in a bank? You yeah. know what I mean? It is a strange one, that, and I think that's probably why I gravitate more towards the acting world at the minute. I think that uh, there's more entrepreneurial spirit in there. I think there's more variety and there's more interesting stuff. Certainly in Liverpool, there's, you know, I thought that when I hadn't been the Royal Court since it's been refurbished till the other week, and I thought that that was how it was set up. It's just brilliant. It, it, the food like, and everything. The food, yeah. The, yeah. the tables, the way you can have a meal and go there and then they'll bring you food. I just thought it was, I think everything about that works for that audience and yeah. I think it brings you know for want of a better word and I hesitate to use it but it just brings 
you know, ordinary working class people into that uh, yeah, environment. There's not, there's not wrong with that, yeah. Where, like you said, you know, um, and you were saying about, you were speaking with Alexi Sale about this, um, working class people don't just like working class culture, oh, you know. Yeah. And I, it's great that things like that are opening out. I think drama and theatre in general is 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 booming in Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. You know. Which is good to see because um, it's, it's a funny one, isn't it? Because the further back you go, the the less class orientated it gets. Shakespeare wrote mm. for me and you and yeah. for that kind of audience that you're talking about. No yeah. question of that. Yeah. You know, he didn't write for bow ties. He didn't write for like six critics in a darkened room yeah. trying to ruin an actor's life yeah. as they did to Stephen Fry. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, that wasn't the deal. Um, it, it's a relatively... Re same thing with opera. You know, you go to Italy... Opera companies, because it's so hot indoors, will rehearse on the street and people will just sit on the pavements yeah. listening to them. You know, whereas here we deify it with yeah. evening wear and all that bollocks. You know, yeah. I, I don't get it. I think a lot you know. of the problem in this country stems from the fact that when Henry VIII dis, you know, abolished the uh, dissolution of the monasteries or whatever, I'm nodding like church. I know. <laughs> no, but you know what he did. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you know, he wanted yeah. to marry someone else. Yeah. So he decided, right, okay, we're going to get rid of the Catholic Church. I'm going to start my own church, and in my church, you don't need an annulment from the Pope. That was the yeah, yeah. essential yeah. Uh, basis of it. But in doing so, the only sort of get out that he had for it was uh, to bring back the third or fourth commandment. I can't remember which, which was "Thou shalt not create false idols." So that was his his get out. So he's like, Catholic Church is full of statues and stained glass and paintings as no no that's that's good and he was harnessing all the protestantism mm. as well anyway you know but in effect when they um smashed those statues up and pulled down the theaters later on the puritans did that and and destroyed the stained glass and burnt mm. the paintings and made churches into a white box because the only art that we had in this country at the time was religious art we became an artless nation right we outlawed art and I think that, you know, and then it came back in the 18th century when we started painting racehorses. So I think that you've got at the heart of the English character, this this sort of puritanical, mm. you know, white box, if you like, where, you know, if you do uh, get a guitar out around a campfire or something mm. like that in this country, sometimes people will turn their back on you and, fuck you, yeah, you yeah, and you're yeah, like, yeah. what? You know, the difference you is... you know that, that's what the song Video Kill the Radio Star was about? Is it really? A, a, a world without art, yeah. Oh, I yeah. never knew that. Yeah, yeah. He, he'd read a short story, possibly by J.G. Ballard, but I'm, I'm not 100% right. sure, where it was a world where there was no art, right. and there was no music, and somebody right. finds a cello. <laughs> that's lovely. Yeah, yeah. And, and that was the inspiration for the song. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I sort of I drifted off a little bit there, but essentially no, I, not I, so I, I think that that's part of the English character to sort of disdain art. Yeah. Absolutely, it is. Yeah, to to not value it in the way that we do yeah. science and well, I mean, obviously, you know, <clears throat> you know, if my kidney needs replacing, I'm not going to go to a comedian. No, you know, absolutely but, not. But that doesn't mean that it should be sort of rubbished in in a way that yeah. it often is, or seen as a thing that you sort of do to unwind and to switch <laughs> off. You know, a friend of mine said recently, um, uh, you know, because he was talking very, very sort of articulately about this and stuff and I said well, you never go and I, and I said is it because you know you sort of I, I, I suspected he'd sort of see it as a way to relax and he said well, no quite the reverse I don't go because I'm that knackered and I would need to switch on and I, it was really re refreshing mm. to hear someone talk about going to the theatre in the way you would go to a football match yeah. do you know what I mean yeah. as in you're pumped up and you're kind of yeah you know, yeah. everything's sort of firing on all, all cylinders or you'll miss something, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I think that it, we do see it as a sort of like, you know, well, we yeah. sit back and we relax while people are working their socks off, you know. Yeah. And I, and I, but to be fair, you know, I, I think that theatre is going to have to take some responsibility for that because the content for a long time has allowed you to mm. not really engage in in any meaningful way you know i mean I, I i don't and i have no i'm not passing any judgments other than my own aesthetic you know but you know gentle comedies and stuff like that have, have never interested me I, i'm not saying they're not worthy and all mm. that kind of thing it just doesn't it's not why i would go and watch something no. you know no um i've just finished watching that um the ricky gervais thing Derek. you know oh, kind yeah. of, it's only one go my god you know i, I was just sort of thinking this is possibly the the most 
sort of elongated examination of old age yeah. I've ever seen. Shame on you, British Theatre, because yeah. I should be able to go and watch a play. Uh, speaking of somebody whose father died from dementia, yeah. I should be able to, that, that, that to me is what the theatre is for, and that's why I gave up any number of potential careers, you know, yeah. to be a part of it. But I mean, w what Ricky Gervais does is just, he's, he's, he's carved his own unique niche, and it isn't just, it is funny, but it's funny, pathos, funny uh, everything. It, it's I, I mean, I, in, in a good way, I thought most of it wasn't, you know, I, ju I just felt I was, you know, you mentioned some of those great writers of the past, and I know it, it may feel a bit too early to say something like this, but I thought I am watching like, Jim Allen in his heyday, you know, yeah. because I, you, you felt it. I remember Steve Coogan said something about Saxondale, which I really, really love. He said, you know, the, 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 the traditional thing is for the central character to be flawed in some way, be that somebody who just bumps into walls or be it like, you know, like Rigsby with his obsessional intrusion and nosiness and all that, yeah. or Basil Fawlty craving order and all that, you know. And he said, what we wanted to do, or what we tried, did with with Saxondale was to take all that out and have someone who's just like pretty intelligent, you know, and yeah. wants to sort of live his life. Is his heyday as as a roadie with Deep Purple and all that is over, mm. and he's now a pest controller. But he's actually not that offensive. He said it as the writer, it forces you to be so much more inventive because mm. where is the comedy? Yeah, and I think maybe this is on Saxondale's shoulders or whatever, or maybe Ricky Gervais never saw it, I don't know, but it just feels like he's pushed that even further again. Mm. Because he was he was the master, wasn't he, particularly in the office, and a little bit of extras of just making you wince and feel uncomfortable because you're oh, watching yeah. someone just unravel. Oh, yeah. But this wasn't really about that, I thought. Th this seemed to put the idea of kindness at the mm. forefront. Oh, yeah. Every single character in that is kind. You yeah. Know, the, the woman who sort of runs the nursing home who's astonishingly good. Um, and, and, and the young girl who, who's sort of her, the, the next in line and everything, they all are really, really, really kind, you know? And, yeah. the, and the, the the older characters who are sort of in, in the home are people who just, they just want to live their life and yeah. they just want to be happy. Yeah. And to get comedy out of that and to get drama out of that as well, because yeah. there's no, well, I was going to say there's no conflict. There is the ultimate conflict, which is death. Yeah. And I've never seen death explored in, in such detail. Yeah, I find it, it very um, very difficult to watch in terms of the emotion that it, it drags me on. It's incredible, but, isn't it? But when I say funny and that, it, uh, what I'm, one of the things I think about it is that, you know, if you think about how Gervais is pulling his face, playing the character, Carl Pilkington's her style, whatever, <laughs> it's quite Brechtian, really, because it's quite, it could be just, Daft. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. he gets away with it in the sort of same way that Shane Meadows in his early films, he has everyone in wigs and stuff <laughs> like that. Because when I first saw, I think it's Small Time Shane Meadows' first film, uh, and they've all got like, they look like NHS wigs on and they look like silly. Yeah. He's got and, I hadn't um, thought of that. Yeah. And when they're all talking like that, I thought they were all taking <laughs> the piece. I didn't know he was from Burton. I didn't know they talked like that, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so I thought that was part of the device. But in, in the same way with um, Derek, you know. Pulling that face and acting like he does, and and you don't laugh at him. No, you, you don't laugh at him. No, which no. is quite a, a feat, really, for a performer. Yeah, yeah. To do that. Well, I think he just. I mean, the the scene where the the dog gets put down, his acting in that is is up there with oh, anything I've ever seen. Great. You know? He is great. He divides opinion, obviously. I know, and I, I'm. I don't. I wonder what that is, you know. Is that just people who are uncomfortable with being uncomfortable? With how Probably uncomfortable sounds, with sitting you know, with their own emotions. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Yeah. You know, I can't watch X Factor or any of that because it's shite, I know. But yeah. I can't watch it because I can't stand the humiliation that people go through yeah. in it. It's just like, oh, fuck this. I don't want to see this circus of horrors, you know. Mm. Um, but another thing you, um, you've done quite a lot of is, is interviewing as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was. Um, I, I mean, that. I. I. It. It would be wrong to say it happened by chance. It. It was by design. But basically, I was. It was only about maybe seven, six years ago, something like that. I was working with somebody who was doing sort of alternative club nights. You know, so you can still get drunk at the end of the night. But it was like you go out on a Friday or a Saturday, and there's something other than just drinking or dancing or a, or a gig or whatever. And was looking around for different things to, to put on you know and we were 
having a conversation about this, and I, I said, um, Paul Denoye was a, a hero of mine. You know, he, he was the founder and editor of Q and Mojo, and I still think he's the finest writer on the subject of music, certainly in this country. You know, he's he's astonishingly good, and he, he does all sort of like McCartney's program bios and sleeve notes and stuff right. like that. But he's written extensively about everybody, and he's interviewed everyone: Pavarotti, Bowie, The Stones. You know, and I said, I've never seen an interviewer interviewed about the art of interviewing you know so that when you go to madonna's house what's it like is there a little ballet you have to do around pas or has she got a room set up like this or do you know what i mean to yeah. actually go right under the skin and interview someone not about themselves or about their work or about the people necessarily about the craft of interviewing what you do when it goes wrong or when you sense that someone's getting a bit guarded so we went ahead with that and did it upstairs in the hope street hotel which has got a room of about like 80 people or something it was a fantastic night it was really really good paul was amazing and the back of his book wondrous place which going back to alexi sale i i think wondrous place in my humble opinion and the first volume of Alexi Sale's autobiography are the two finest books about Liverpool you could possibly read, right. you know, because they're free of some of the stuff that makes you recoil a little bit and all that. But they are absolutely loving and celebratory of the city and and realistic uh, about us as well, you know. And, the, and so anyway, one, wondrous place uh, is, is a book that every three or four years I'll just kind of sit and 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 read it again just to kind of remind myself of how shit I am in comparison to Paul, you know. But anyway. The back of that book has a list of 100 songs written about this city, either by local artists or, for example, the Suzanne Vega song in Liverpool is, is in there, you know, and, and that one the Bangles did as well. And I said to the person I was working with, I said, you know, you, you had that roll call of Ian McNabb, Ian Prowse, you know, and they were all named in, in there. And I said, they're all going to be in the audience. Why don't we sort of get them? to do their songs, that would put such a spin on the whole evening, you know. And I always saw that as a one-off night that would not be repeated. And it was suggested, um, but, you know, but by the person I worked for, that it would work as a series, and that was where it started. So we went, we did a couple in the Anglican Cathedral, did Mike McCartney, Janice Long, that was the only one I didn't do, Dave Monks did that one. Um, and then we moved to St George's Hall, and the idea for that series, which came to an end about a year and a bit ago, or two years ago maybe, was that um, it were people who were sat kind of associated with, with Liverpool. Mm. Ian St John, you know, who's lived here since he, he played for the team. Yeah. You know, but we also did Jamie Carragher, we did uh, Ricky Tomlinson, Stephen Graham, Peter Serafinowicz, which I thought was... And I'm not taking credit for any of these. I, you know, I didn't sort of get the guests. I got to do the sexy bit at the end and finish the job off you know but I never thought he'd agree to be interviewed and he did and he was absolutely fantastic yeah. you know, he, was, he, was, he was brilliant yeah. Linda LaPlante um, again who's a, a sort of hero of mine as well Michael Heseltine less so but was a very interesting <laughs> <laughs> subject that's kind of where I was heading then oh so, was it so yeah just, that's the only uh, time I've made the press was that one because he said I was talking absolute crap when I suggested that um uh, people on zero hours contracts may struggle to put a financial base down for their families and he just went on in front of however many hundred people it was you know but it wasn't um i'll t tell you exactly what happened so uh, af after he, he he said he said the problem the problem with people like you is you don't realize you know there's more people in employment now than there's ever been and, <coughs> I, and I said well yes but if that employment doesn't involve a, a six month or a, a year long contract or whatever then it's impossible to put a financial base down and at that point he said what you're saying is absolute crap and where this came from I don't know but I said well maybe one man's crap is another man's socialism and we should, perhaps shouldn't fall out in front of the audience mm -hmm. but I don't want to set this up as if he was some kind of big twat or anything he yeah. wasn't you know I mean yeah. I I, um, I don't wear his colours and I, I, I told him that be before we went out but I wasn't foolish enough to think I could sort of spar with him for two hours that would have been a horrendous experience for the audience i just thought if the subject matter is appropriate then we, we would be mm. as two people with, with opposing views no i think that to. i think that there's there needs to be a hell of a lot more of that anyway especially now because people at the minute now things are getting so fucking crazy with people 
I mean, literally falling out over political opinions. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know. Well, strangers as well, you know. I mean, the, the, sorry to... Cut no, off, no, please, the, carry on. The, the, last, um, the last three times I've been out and gone into a conversation with a stranger, they have raised everything that's going on at the moment with the absolute fire in the eyes of you mm. disagree with me and we're going to fall it's out. Fucking, it's it really is. It's madness, this. It's binary. You know, people are just expecting... That there's, there's very little amongst the general public from what I can see discussion and discourse and respect for even a scintilla of the other person's opinion yeah. it's like if you don't agree I'm going to restate my opinion at an increasingly loud volume yeah. until you either agree or leave I'm all for anybody speaking their opinion and then if it's wrong it can die in the sunlight you can really. have the dialogue can't you You know. and I think that when yeah. you drive opinion underground it gets very dangerous I think we're seeing yeah. that in Italy now yeah. with the government there because it's sort of like you know you're not allowed to speak about what you think's bothering you and da, 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 da. you're this 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 and this and so the right in Italy now is just mm. fucking it's quite um well, I don't know they like that over there anyway don't they yeah. <laughs> but you know it, it does seem like this is a very right wing um, government yeah. coming in in Italy and you do fear that if ideas that are not particularly good for social cohesion or for you know the the betterment of our society full stop if they're not allowed to be discussed and you know if wrong then destroyed because that's the whole idea behind debate then you do wonder what preconceptions people are going to walk into the the voting booths with yeah this is what concerns me because things they won't say in public they will in private you yeah create, uh... well i mean yeah yeah i mean I, 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 of all the the recent stories um the one that appalled me the most was the boris johnson taking tea out to the reporters now the reason why that appalled me was that that act was then reported as news right that's not news a man taking a tray of tea and you know what shame on those reporters who didn't go fuck your teammate answer the question yeah. why did you know shame yeah. on them yeah. because yeah. that's what they were there to do not drink tea yeah you know and it was it looked to me anyway and I, I shouldn't have just said that actually because you know what I would make a rubbish reporter but it seemed that deference was being shown there mm. you know so that he can actually make a statement that would have got Bernard Manning in trouble and hand tea to the person who had the opportunity to challenge him on it. It was so choreographed with grotty cups, wasn't it? And yeah. There was, wasn't there like, like sugar with the spoon in the bag? Yeah, and the milk's still in the bottle. Like, that's what it's like on the other side of oh, the door. I, I really don't think yeah, so. Yeah, the Royal Dalton stayed in the house. It was, like, <laughs> yeah. it was all like cream egg cups and free cups. <laughs> yeah. And it was totally yeah. choreographed. Yeah. Apparently, the what he wore oh, of course, was yeah. the stuff that the... Um, the the rowing Cambridge or Oxford rowing team wore, you know, and everything. Yeah, yeah. It was so well choreographed, yeah, yeah. but it was. Oh, you went to a comprehensive school. I, oh. I, I've got some chips in here. <laughs> you, you, could have, you could have a cream egg cup, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, this yeah. this bumbling buffoon act serves uh, people very well. Trump really, really. being another example, mm. and Prince Philip, who's got <laughs> who's gotten away with the bumbling off act for uh, yeah, years. But yeah, these are powerful yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. It's know. when people say that they, they go, "He's a character." Well, Bugs yeah. Bunny's a character. I don't yeah. want him. I don't want his finger on the button. Thanks very much. No, you know no, what no, I mean? But this is... It's not enough to just be a character. But, but people are happy to underestimate and call these people stupid. Yeah, yeah. And I think I don't think if there's one thing Trump is is not is I don't think he's stupid. Yeah. I really don't think he's stupid. They've both, you know, John, he and Johnson, they've both got the narrative exactly where they want it right now. Well, Johnson's. I mean, and he, he could, he's he could be in charge. Steve Bannon, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. So. The tea routine, the not apologising, mm. it for me, it's it's straight out of that playbook. Mm. That's mm. that's the way it seems. Because mm. there was a tyranny in the way he was offering the tea, wasn't oh. there? Have some tea, you know. It yeah. wasn't like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I do yeah, have some tea. Yeah. yeah, but it was the cups. The yeah, cups yeah, were yeah. proper garage, own, yeah, own bargain yeah. shit. Yeah, yeah, and it was definitely yeah. to let you know. Whilst we're sat in the house having yeah, yeah. lobster on silver sals, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can have the shitty cream egg. Yeah, cup. yeah. So someone should have gone in. It's like the, the, there's one of his mates fixing a bike in the front room. <laughs> I don't think so. I'd have loved it if someone had a fucking lads in his face. That'd have been cracking, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. But none of them are going to do that. No. And because now, I mean, believe this or not, and well, you were in education, so you you know this. They run journalism courses at universities now, and some of the classes are what questions not to ask. Oh. 
Jesus yeah, Christ, yeah. man. Yeah. That's that's how far we've fallen. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I think that the discourse being removed from the people who should be doing the fucking jobs, journalists, mm. then ends up just being uh, spat on well, Twitter. Do you know what I mean? That, given that there's so many channels now, and, and and podcasts like this and everything, what you know, one another place where I've I've worked uh, over the last few years is in Buxton at the at the festival, and I interviewed Nick Clegg there again. You know, somebody who we all felt so let down oh. by, by the coalition. But I mean, I, I don't mind quoting this because he said it in front of. 900 people you know he said i i i do regret you know what i did and he said i thought when i went into it that i could stop things he said i knew that he said i thought an unbridled conservative government would be a terrible thing and at least we might be able to just chip away at little things here and there and i'm sat there thinking well i've never ever heard you say that on television but why because tv interviews are like three minutes long mm. you remember those those old like face-to-face -face things oh, and all yeah, that you know fantastic um i think was it david hare it was yeah david hare wrote in, in, in one of his sort of um diaries and, and set of memoirs he was talking about the art of interviewing somebody and he said if you just sit back and let them talk and let them talk and let them talk they will eventually start to tell the truth yeah you know yeah. they'll feel uncomfortable and that will just sort of dilute all the bullshit and you'll get the truth yeah. you know and i i think it's it's so it, it it's a rare thing isn't it to to see someone on tv or radio there used to be a brilliant thing on radio merseyside when bob azardia rest his soul was alive and he he would do like hour-long interviews with like bill shankley or i think he interviewed thatcher at one point yeah you know? um and again, you know, forty minutes into that is where it gets really, yeah. really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's. Um, I think Parkinson was good at that. Certainly in his BBC days. Yeah. He was good at just letting people talk, and. Um, well, they had not to plug, did they? If you had Richard Burton on, he was oh, there because yeah. he was Richard Burton, not because he had a film out. Yeah. So your new book, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, that won't be flying off the shelves anytime soon. <laughs> But Buxton's a great place, isn't it? What was that, the Opera House? The Opera House, yes. Yeah. So they, each year, um, they have t um, the Buxton Festival, which is predominantly opera, but has been more and more... Um, it was, it was, there was a sort of a literary spin-off that, that right. has, it has its own momentum now. And again, I was brought in... Um, to Simon's still there. Simon, he still, he's he still lives in Buxton. No, he, yeah. still, he still lives in Buxton. Yeah, yeah. It was Simon who got me in... Um, who I'd worked for at the Philharmonic Hall and, and who's a, a, a great friend and a, a fantastic man. And he got again, us playing the fantastic yeah, what kind of figure thing. Liverpool needs as well. Yes. You know, um, yeah. or needs, needs him, to come back. Needs him back, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, 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 I think it was down to the availability of the other interview and I interviewed Kirsty Walk. Right. And that was like, oh my God, you know, because I, I, I don't mind admitting, you know, I get very in awe of people who are brilliant at what they do yeah. and I was just thinking, well, you think of all the things she's done and in a life situation that's the that's the <clears throat> the clincher isn't absolutely, it the life absolutely thing. yeah yeah Jesus Christ. um but she was she was lovely you know yeah. um and very very interesting to talk to and all that you know so that was my first one and that kicked off a sort of an association um with buxton so i've i've been going back yet yeah, about four or five years now um and some really interesting people that was where i interviewed alexi sale mm. um uh, Leslie Garrett, you know the opera singer again. Yeah. She, uh, I played "You'll Never Walk Alone" with her on the piano, which right. was like, how bizarre is this? You know, um, I, I, yeah, it's a, it's a it's a great place. It's quite small, um, and the audience is very sort of they're comfortable in their own skin, you know, yeah. uh, and they're a nice audience, but they're not to be underestimated mm. in any sphere. You know, they're very sort of intelligent and and, and very. Uh, you know, f f kind of well read, and as I say, just just ready for the best you can give them. Really, you know. So I I relish doing it, but it it's it's tough. Mm. But it should be, you know. Yeah. It, it should, you know, it's a it's a privilege to sit doing what we're doing now and have people pay to sit there. You know. So um, I I I I love doing it, and I I think I'd love to see more of that just to people mm. particularly someone who's had you know someone like Alexi Sale his career yeah. right absolutely right at the start of something in the way that Peter Cook was yeah. you know um, 
and has, has sustained. I mean, his, his novels are fantastic. Yeah. I mentioned Stephen Fry before. I mean, yeah. it's a, there's an obvious antipathy between them that they've both stated publicly, you know. Um, that is understandable, you know. It's like two people in a band have a row and yeah. no one cares, but two high powered authors, and suddenly yeah. it's, you know, all over The Guardian or whatever. But, um, yeah, you know, they, they, they attract those kind of people. But I would like to see more of that on, on radio, television, or podcast where you just get access to someone's experience yeah. and them, yeah. their mind. I think the reason why I, I like doing it is that ultimately I'm a fan, you know. I mean, mm. you can't do that professionally, you can't allow that. Mm. And and not everybody, you know, I interviewed Vince Cable, for example, you know, yeah. so you, you know, but what I do have almost without exception is a, a genuine deep seated respect for anyone who has sustained a career and achieved, you know, I may not be into the current book or whatever, whatever that may be, you know, yeah. but I think that's why I, I don't mind if I will get a particularly, you know, if I've only got three or four weeks to get an interview together it never bothers me because i think well my god this is someone who when i was eight was on the telly and that do you know what i yeah, mean yeah, yeah. And that's not just going oh bow down to someone because they're famous i don't mean it like that at all um yeah you know that's crass but um a a anyone who it's it's not as you well know you know particularly in the world of performance it's not easy to, to, to get known and to... Oh, yeah, gotcha. You know, yeah, do you yeah. know what I mean? And I hate it when I see people sort of trivialise. The Royal Court thing you were talking about, um, one of the lead actors in that was Les Dennis, and I went down to London to see a play that he was in immediately after that. So he was, like, in the Royal Court thing and rehearsing something that was playing at the Park Theatre in London. That was about comedy, actually. It was about the sort of... the boundaries, what is acceptable... It was a play called End of the Pier that was absolutely fantastic, you know. And he's someone I'd love to interview because he's had, like, three different yeah. careers. Yeah, know? he's an interesting guy, full stop, I reckon him. Absolutely, and a talented yeah. as well, you know. Massively, sort of, that whole association with Ricky Gervais that began about ten years ago, yeah. I think brought him to a brand new audience, yeah, and yeah. rightly so. Well, know? that's because, again, he's not afraid, oh. you know. You get and, and, and fair play to all those people who did extras with him. None of them were afraid. Kate Winslet, you know. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> Ross Kemp. Yeah. I will unleash hell. He's playing with his heart and just being, you know, just being yeah. like a little boy. Yeah. But, no, I mean, Ricky Gervais is, is phenomenally good and unique. Yeah. But Keith, the Keith Chegger one was very uncomfortable oh, to watch, wasn't it? fucking yeah. hell, yeah. So skilled as well, the, yeah. the way he had that really dark undertones. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what it is that he's got, but he's, he's certainly... He, he's probably one of the most famous comedians in the world now. Ricky Gervais, I, I would say, wouldn't you? Uh, yeah, it must be yeah. followed by three million people on Twitter or whatever yeah, it is, yeah. you know. And it, a lot of American market, you know. You know all yeah, Golden yeah. Globes and everything. Yeah, I love the uh, the word Bowie's in extras. <laughs> yeah, he does yeah. that song. Yeah, it's just fucking. Crap. Well, they, they said about that, didn't they? They said when when they were having to deal with him, uh, him and Stephen Merchant, he said, you know, you can't separate the absolute like in all thing uh, and he said uh, they they rang him and he said he was making this really weird noise he said excuse me I'm, I'm eating a banana and um, it was Stephen Merchant who said he, he said we thought like he's in his he's still got the strife down his yeah, face yeah. he's not expecting yeah, yeah. to be yeah. you know um, but I, I think what it is with Ricky Gervais he's really brave you know yeah. I mean he he really goes there in terms of our emotions yeah. The Office did that yeah. You know, that yeah. horrible insecurity of David Brent. Yeah. Always trying to just get to the next level and yeah. to impress yeah. when the, the ship's long sailed, you know. Yeah. That's all King Lear is. I know that sounds wanky of me, but that's all it, it's the same thing, you know. It's it, it it's really, really exploring the the, the soul. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, and how full of fear we can be and how we use humour to well, that's what the entertainer is. Yeah, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's it's that sort of examination constantly of the human condition, and how people can do it to create art and entertainment. Mm. It's just inc it is incredible. So it's like, well, I'm, I t I, am I to take it from this work that you suffer with all this, the artist, you know, and you're able to do that as well, mm. you know, like he does Derek or whatever he does, because all these things always seem to be coming from a, a place of contemplation and pain, mm. at the very least. Mm. contemplation mm. and yet they're able to channel I think the great ones are able to channel everything they've gone through in life or what they observe in life into this stuff 
mm. with with no fear because we're all we all hold ourselves back whether we like it or not you know we do have those sort of we all the time not leaving your comfort zone not not doing this and not doing that um you know you've mentioned while we were talking a couple of events that you could have you could have gone either way on you know for example the mabel fletcher thing you could have gone oh well fuck it you know people do mm. and then they never they never try mm. you know with what they're doing in life so the, the the junctions in life that interest me when people talk to me where they could have thrown it all away or they could have let themselves be beaten down yeah i, I mean i think the f for me the reason why that has yet to happen is i, I still I still think I might be shit. You know what I mean? I'm not. I'm not saying that to go. Please now <laughs> praise me. I don't mean that at all. I. I can. I'm no different now. I mean, you know, going back to school. I, I used to have like, I, I had a six string guitar and a twelve string and a trumpet, right? And if I had a school orchestra rehearsal on the same day that we were doing games, that meant I had a bag as well. And I, I, you know, I was short then as well. So I was like a little pack horse going into school. And a couple of I can't remember what it was. I was doing something about a week ago or two weeks ago, and I had to carry my guitar and something else. I thought this hasn't really altered all that much because, <laughs> because now the only difference now is, I I think if I don't turn up, if I don't do this, they'll stop asking. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's the fear. Yeah. And they will. You know, there's, there's far more talented people than me around. So I think if someone goes, "Can you do this in three days?" and I go, "No," in a year's time, they're not going to yeah. go. Oh, let's phone that bloke who didn't turn up yeah do you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. um so it is a sort of because it's a privilege to be able to stand in front of an audience and you need to be careful not to gush that one out too much but it is a privilege when you consider the amount of people who try to do that absolutely you know and, absolutely. and, and become deeply unhappy at not being able to and that could be me in six weeks time and you know and I, that's a fact that's not a sort yeah. of yeah yeah no that's a fact so i still I'm driven by fear and insecurity, and I know that's what everyone says, but everyone says it because it's actually true. Yeah, it is true. It is true. And that. Prob no, I don't think I've met anybody for whom it's not true in this game. Mm. They might say it's not, and then then something will happen, and you'll go, "Oh yeah, yeah, you're just as uh, you're just the same," you mm. know. Um, but it, it is. That's the game. I mean, and and to to confront that. To confront the insecurity is to do the job. I mean, you know, the amount of times that you walk through a door and you've got a knot through your stomach, you're like, oh, I shouldn't even be here. I fucking, why the fuck am I here? Mm. I can't do this. Mm. And then you do it, and then you've got a little spring in your step, and you're like, oh, I can do this. And then you get about an hour of that, and then later it's like, oh, fucking hell, I don't know how I got away with that. Okay, mm. so the next thing, you know, I... I, I, I had to put very, very similar to that put really well i interviewed marco pierre white not so long ago and that was i don't know i don't know why this happened but when i read his book because his brash that thing that he's known for to me on a personal level i would just recoil from that you know in a social mm. situation i just go what a tosser yeah. but i knew not too far from where we are now there used to be a fantastic restaurant called lalouette and i'm no foodie i know bugger all you know but the guy who ran that um, for some reason, we would get into conversations about food, and like I say, I I have I can bring no sophisticated knowledge or anything, but we just sort of connected as as people in a way, you know. And when I was reading his book, Marco Pierre Weiss, I thought there's something in this that I'm really drawn towards. There's something in your personality. There's a sadness to him. Mm. He was constantly referencing his mother, who he lost when he was very young, and he was brought up in a very very male household, and and he kept that there was a bit where he described. Uh, the big restaurant of the day was a place called La Gavroche, which was by far the most like esteemed, acclaimed place in the, in the whole of the UK. And he'd gone down to be interviewed for somewhere else, and he'd walked past and was just stood outside. Well, I did that at the National Theatre when I was about 17 or something, you know. So it just chimed straight away. I just thought that slightly lonely, slightly weird, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Mm. And he described really well, just desperate to kind of be a part of it all, you know. And he stayed up all night and, and knocked on the door the next day. And they said, yeah, okay, you can, you can be interviewed. And they sent him to the office of, of the owner. It was a guy called Albert Roux. And the way he described it was, he said, I knocked on the door 
but I didn't want it to open. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I thought, oh, you've put that as well <laughs> as any poet there, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I really liked him, you know. I think I think for, a, a, I mean, one, again, this is what I'm always drawn towards is the guy's skill. You know, he's phenomenally skilled mm. at what he does. It's not bullshit. It's not all fronts. Mm. It's not brash. He is phenomenally skilled, even if in a way that I will never be or, or don't particularly have an interest in. And as I say, I'm being incredibly bio mission disrespectful to every brain surgeon that ever carried out an operation now because, do you know what, it's still just a roast potato. Yeah. And here I am, waxing lyrical. But it's also but, performance. And I'm ashamed of that. In a way. With those, nah, not at all. You can see that the parallels, because what they do is performance, and they want acceptance also. They want to be the best mm. at what they mm. do. Yeah, yeah. And the guy who died recently, Anthony Bourdain, mm. um, the American chef, um, he, he's he's a fascinating person to hear interviewed. You know, sadly, he's, he's just died. Like, But... Um, mm. You know, he says because he was a um, he was a junkie. You know, when he was oh, younger, right. he was an he was still a chef. Yeah. But yeah, he was saying you know he was really not doing living up to his full potential. Mm. And he said you know he did that thing he used to get up in the morning, look himself in the mirror in the eye in the morning, and you know and all this thing that addicts do when they wake up. And and he said the difference between him and people who didn't recover and didn't get on with their lives is that when he looked in the mirror, he saw something worth saving. <laughs> So there's got to be some element of your character that is still a little bit arrogant in, in everything that you do to succeed. You've still got to have, you know, like Lennon said, he said, uh, part of me thinks I'm a loser, the other part thinks I'm Jesus fucking Christ, mm. you know. And mm. I think that it's that um, split within the character of performers or chefs or musicians, the ones that rise to the top of the industry, I think they've all got that self-belief and you've got to have it. But at the same time, you don't want the door to open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you've got, to, you've got to have the belief to get you to the fucking door and then when it opens, it's like I'm planning shows for December and stuff, you know, I have been for a few months and I'm planning them and I'm like, oh, you know, I don't really want these to happen. But <laughs> when I get there, I will. Yeah, yeah, of course. Do you know what's odd though? It's like you, I don't know about you, but I never know, you never know what you can really control and sometimes so you know one of the biggest adrenaline rushes you will ever get is the sound of 2,000 people laughing at something you just oh. did I mean that is a phenomenal yeah, sensation you know and I, I did a play I did the same play about four or five times at the Royal Court and we also did it at the Empire and at the Manchester Opera House as well and there used to be the, I had three points in that play where I knew that I was working with Paul Duckworth you yeah. know him and we really read each other very well on stage, and we always knew the, the, the how to sort of time it, you know, and it was, it was a very, very slow, drawn-out gag, and it was almost like you could feel the audience thinking, surely they're not going to make the most obvious joke in history, and then when we did, that that, that was kind of the payoff, <laughs> you know. But <clears throat> having done that, like, over 100 times, that became, I remember thinking, this is just incredible, you know, this is better than anything. But... I, I, you know, two or three nights ago, I was at a, a, a friend's party and they asked me to play the piano and I stood in the bathroom more full of fear, wanting a fire alarm to go off yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. To not walk in that room that had seven people in it. Yeah. And, and... That's far worse. Oh, God. It, thank you, because I thought it was just me. No, no. <laughs> you can enjoy the clip online. I reference it oh, after okay. where I have a panic attack doing the show, right? right. And I, I, had, I literally had a panic attack. Like Duncan Thicket. Like, <laughs> proper, yeah. Uh, but it was in a, a little pub theatre in London. Yeah. You know, well, a room above a yeah. pub in London. Uh, it's not even a, a pub theatre now. In Kentish Town. And because... People are in. I mean, Aid Edmondson was in there as oh. well. No, but I'd, see that I'd have lost it. Yeah, but <laughs> it wasn't just that; it was the proximity. Mm. And then when we did the Palladium, everyone's there, and it's dark, and there's lights yeah. in your face, and, and you you're controlling see. it. But when you when you're aware of the noise coming from mm. them, it's a fucking great feeling. Mm. Yeah, mm. it's great when you can play the pause as long as you can as well. You yeah, know, yeah, I did yeah. that at. Um, it's very few of these things you remember. You know, when you're on stage, I don't know how you feel about this, but to me, it always feels like you know when you go swimming and you get out of the pool. Mm. I always feel when I'm off stage that I've, I've been swimming. It feels like you've been immersed in. Oh yeah, 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 in something for yeah. however long you've been on, and so I don't remember very much about 
shows really mm. and it's only certain moments mm. you remember and there was one moment and it was at the Bristol Old Vic and I remember I was stage left and it was just like I was frozen in time and for some reason I was able to just hold this fucking pause for ages and ages well it probably weren't mm. yeah, <laughs> for yeah. you it's ages but, but for the yeah, audience maybe yeah. not Yeah. and so I loved the um, fact that that they are so few and far between because they're more special than yeah, little memories, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. For, for you, really, yeah. as a performer. Yeah, yeah, you know. true, true. But stage acting's so much different to screen acting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it is. And I mean, I think there's a sort of misconception uh, when people think, oh, well, you know, on, on telly you get to do it over and over again. You try fluffing a line on a TV set and you'll soon find out. Fucking hell, the clock's running. Yeah, yeah, you Jesus. don't get to do it over and over no. again. But it, it's, a, it's a completely different skill and it's very interesting when you watch really good screen actors up close and there's everything is going on. The thought process. You know, yeah, yeah. But if you're not in the take and you're kind of watching them from a distance, you just think, well, what are they doing? Mm. And then you get up close and it's a, it's a totally different... Yeah. I, I worked with James Nesbitt and he was just brilliant up close you know yeah. hence he's in so many close ups yeah, you know yeah. um and and you rarely get people who are equally skilled I saw Chris Eccleston who I had my first ever job with him um on a thing called Hearts and Minds in 1994 when I just left college uh, and I went down to see him play Macbeth and he had that real command of the stage mm. which I'd only ever seen him on screen you know but the actor for me, ab above everyone, and it is just a, a bit of hero worship kicking in, but who I think, you, you're talking, I think, about playing pauses and everything, but could do it on screen as well, was Rick Mayall. I, I just found mm. him phenomenal on, on screen because he he could do almost like the energy of a live performance without looking over the top. He was over the top in his own way. Mm. But I don't know if you ever saw that series he did oh, for Granada. Oh, Dancing Queen. Yeah, and that. yeah. I mean, that... I, did, I did think you might be going to watch oh, that. God, isn't Just, it? Yeah. yeah <laughs> Thank yeah. God, it's on, someone's put it on YouTube. Good. It's brilliant. Yeah, it's brilliant. Da Dancing Queen is one of the best in that series, I think. But um, I, I, I saw him on stage in non-comedy stuff. I saw the Common Pursuit, which I think would be about. 89 or something like that and that was him Stephen Fry John Sessions John Gordon Sinclair it's by a writer called Simon Gray who I really love he was sort of eclipsed by Pinter and they were very good friends and they used to sort of direct each other's work and everything but they were all in that and I, I saw Rick Mayall in Waiting for Godot oh well. really yeah yeah oh. and that was Aid, Aid Edmondson oh, as well man, too. I'd love to have seen that it was it was astonishing well the was early episodes of Bottom are oh, very, very like that, aren't yeah, they? You yeah, know, totally, totally. The, the gas man one, where it's like the, <laughs> the flat seems to be when they show you out the window and everything. It's really, yeah, it's nowhere, un unnerving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels like it could be a hundred feet up in yeah, there, like yeah. JG Ballard. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, that, you know? yeah. And I, I saw him in something else on. St oh, I saw Cellmates. Oh wow. Yeah, but after Stephen Fry had left. Oh right. And one thing that again really touched me, uh, and Sam and Gray's diaries of, of, of that period are, are almost like a love letter to Rick Mayall or, or to his professionalism that was one thing that really inspired me and stayed with me in terms of how privileged we are to perform and what we owe our mm. audience rest his soul for this there were 12 people in the theatre and he played that theatre like it was Wembley yeah. do you know what I mean yeah, and yeah. I thought I've worked with people and I know people who in your position would have failed on that job or would have gone out and at least had one little wink to the audience as if I know this has died on its arse now, you know, because the production's fallen through and everything. Not a bit of it. And I just thought, oh my God, to have, to have seen that up close and to have shared the earth, however over the top that sounds, with someone so dedicated mm. to being a professional, then anyone who ever gives me a fiver for doing anything will get the best I can do. It doesn't mean it's going yes. to be brilliant. It yeah. doesn't mean it's going to be brilliant. It will mean I will be doing it as well as I can yeah. do it. Yeah. And I've only had one time in my career where I know, I've, I mean, there have probably been others, but there was one when I know I was under par and I will, I will go to my grave regretting it, you know. Yeah. We're lucky to do what we do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. we work hard as well, you know. It's not, oh, a, yeah. it's not a gift. Yeah. But to be able to, to do that, and I think... I got I took so much from watching him. I learned so much. Just not not from just his skill, but his humanity towards the audience. 
And I think that ties in with what we were saying about Ricky Gervais, actually. Mm. He's ultimately someone who's got a lot of love and, res- and respect. Yeah. Genuine yeah. respect. Not thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and all that yeah. stuff, which we all know is, yeah. is you know, a genuine respect for other people. Yeah. What I love about Derek is that it's a, it's about ordinary people. It's not about an extraordinary character. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. He manages to just hold the mirror up to nature, you know what yeah. I mean? And, and show us all yeah. that we're on the same journey yeah. and we need to be nice to each other. Yeah. And that shouldn't be, you know, that shouldn't be something that sounds sugary or schmaltzy or is to be, you know, sidelined at the expense of something that's more cynical and edgy. It's actually quite, it's quite difficult to to have a smile on your face all yeah, the time, yeah. you know. And yet Derek, he's, he's, he just exudes kindness. Yeah, yeah. And consequently he's happy. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, it's something that has been lost in the modern world, really, just the act of kindness. People being nice to each other. Because, as you say, you're always meant to be sort of edgy or you're meant to have an attitude or, you yeah. know, you've got to have this. I think there's um and that goes right across all you know that that it's easy to think of that as a kind of more london centric cynical thing it's, it's not you know no. I, I had a complete stranger say to me yesterday what do you do for a living i teach drama you're any good like well, where did you where'd you go with that well, you blame emery the eight <laughs> i will i will do that next time because he destroyed art in this country yeah you know it's just like you cheeky bastard you know yeah. what, what i'm supposed to sit here in front of a complete stranger and start proving myself Justify i don't think so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah you gotta pay for that <laughs> yeah well yeah we need money first <laughs> yeah. as Lennon yeah. said yeah. i think one of the best examinations of uh, that sort of acting process that you referred to you've probably read it you seem to have read um all these things but the anthony sher book Oh, Year of the King. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's a good, mm. a good sort of mm. a, a look at how you're not worthy, and but you're still going to do it, and, yeah. and all the trials and tribulations that you go through. One of the things when we were chatting the other week was um, the fact. Well, you know, we can we can be honest about this now and say we are yes fans. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's. Um, oh God, how many girlfriends have I lost in my life because? Oh of that? man. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Do you remember the half and half biscuit line, which is, uh, and so I wipe snot down the arm of your couch as you put another Roger Dean poster on the wall. And um, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, it's true. It's one of the most unfa- as, as unfashionable as being nice is yeah. is to, is to like yes, really. Uh, not all of it. Not all of it. Absolutely not all of it. You know, I don't well, I mean, like... Owner of Lonely Art was like a number one in America, wasn't it? Or yeah, like well, that. I mean, no. and it's a great album, actually. It's I can good. now admit now that <laughs> the, the yeah. statute of limitations is lifted. <laughs> but, um, no, what I found interesting was um, you saying that you'd work with Alan White. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah. Yeah, I, I played the songs Imagine and Instant Karma with him, both of which, of course, he's on yeah. as, as the drummer, you know, and that was like one... <laughs> degree of separation from the song imagine you know uh, yeah yeah and that, that was great and again i mean i i, I was it's kind of you've got to do it it's sad in a way i mean when i did the gig i didn't crack on how much of a fan i was you know um because it would have made him it would have put him on the back foot and you, you just don't do it you know but um i came out of the philharmonic hall going i've just, I've just played with Alan <laughs> white out of yes you know what i mean and uh, i thought i've got to decompress in some way yeah. I walked into the Philharmonic pub, but he was there, right. <laughs> and he just went like that. He called me over, <laughs> so and, and I said to him, "I said, I said, look, Alan, you know, I wasn't going to say this before, but cards on the table. You know, I've, you've been my favourite drummer since I was about fourteen, and he since looked Bill Brufford left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he looked genuinely pleased, and I tell you what, what he did, he's they just brought out Fly from Here, right." And he said, have you got the new album? And I said, no. And when I said no, he looked genuinely, I wouldn't say disappointed. There was something something washed across his face. And I thought, this is brilliant. You're still in the moment. You're still like the current record yeah, yeah. is what is, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we, we, we spoke for a while. I, 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 they'd not long done the tour with the symphony orchestra, which I thought was amazing. Yeah, it's and, great, yeah. You know, and he had some really interesting things to say about that. I mean, that was 18 months. And he said, we auditioned every single one of them separately and we spoke to them all because we thought, well, if we're going to be on the road, you know, and the footage of that is lovely because uh, you do know we're now going down the rabbit hole. Right. We, we, you've said the Y word. Yeah, you know? well, that's that. <laughs> um, you know, they all look so pleased and so happy and so in the moment. And these are young musicians. They're all about 25 or yeah. something, you know. And um, 
I think in in that you know yeah for me when they go full throttle particularly when they do on you and I and and yeah. he's really going at it there's nothing like that you know although it's not as male a thing as you would think it was actually a girl who got me into yes right. when I, when I was at school yeah yeah so again this idea that as Liverpoolians we're all, we're only into the Lars and stuff you know <laughs> this is a this is a, a comprehensive school in in Liverland you know. And my friend Trish would, would play, uh, going for the one was the first sort of, and again, that I heard Turn of the Century and I'd never yeah. heard, with the exception of Hey Jude, a song that was seven minutes long, but yeah. that was like this story about a statue that came to life. Well, it's The Winter's Tale, Yeah. you know? Yeah. And we were doing Shakespeare at the time. and, and Well, again, that must be crystallised, that memory for you. It really yeah. is, it really is, because again, it was just this opening up of like that music could be, and then of course, Genesis weren't far behind, you yeah, know. Well, I... But to 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 just all these references and all how weird Chris Squire's bass playing was, but also how punchy it was, you know, because yeah. not not that far away from John Entwistle or oh, or, no, or McCartney by any means, you know. Yeah. And then you had this guy with a really really high voice, and we I don't know why this is. I've always preferred female vocal like Sam Brown is a big hero of mine I've mentioned Kate Bush before I'm really into a, a singer called Tina Dico and I don't know whether it's because just because of the pitch there's a separation that the vocal is so much a, a part and other from the rest of the sound whereas if it's like Ian Gillen or David Coverdale or someone it's nearer yeah. to what the guitar's doing yeah. let's see it's that high C in child in time yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and again you know John Lord is a, 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 big, oh, a big hero yeah. I got actually talking about Simon I, I owe Simon for what you know one memory that will never leave me was not long after John Lord died I, I said to Simon you know he had these two sort of pillars one was his his rock stuff and the other was his orchestral stuff and he towards what sadly turned out to be the end of his life he struck up a relationship with the Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra re-recorded the purple you know the, the symphony of mm. uh, the album and did a couple of other things all of which I had which I really loved and I said you know it would be a great thing to get a member of the orchestra and then a hairy arsed rocker to play one of his pieces together to represent and Simon just went well why don't you do it and I said well no I will recommend the song get a piano player and he went no why not? so I got to play the Philharmonic Hall with Jonathan Asgard who's the uh, principal cellist who'd worked with John Lord um, and I think there was a documentary on the BBC about the whole prog thing and they put it really well they said this a lot of this music is surprisingly beautiful Mm. And it is. There's a beauty yeah. in what a lot, and uh, also with a lot of what Yes do. And Steve House said this himself. He said we would get a really good groove and a really good melody, and then we just go, "How can we complicate this?" Yeah, yeah. And that even that grates on me a little bit. But they're so skilled. Oh, do you yeah. know what I mean? And that's enough. I can enjoy just hearing how on earth are you actually all managing to keep this. That's fragile. Album. <laughs> I mean, fragile for me is R is just. Yeah. <coughs> and Rick Wakeman's solo on that <coughs> Roundabout. <sighs> Is he manages to get a Hammond up to the level of if it were Jimmy Page on guitar, you yeah. know, he manages to yeah. make it that aggressive, I think. Well, he said to me, Rick, he said to me that um, up until now, I'm gonna have to point, touch you because you've worked with him, <laughs> <isn't> he? <laughs> he's a great guy. But he, he said to me that um, for, for the first time, classical music was in the hands of working people. He said that he thinks that, that like you said before. You know, it's weird how it comes back to this again. But the the normal working, you know, class person should not uh, get their hands on sort of like the gears or the levers of culture. And then all of a sudden, they had all these guys who were sticking bits of uh, symphonies into the songs and stuff. You know, um, and and Deep Purple doing exactly the same. Um, Absolutely. And yeah. working with orchestras and stuff. But but that's that's what he said. I think that that kind of resonates really. For once, it wasn't the preserve of somebody. Even ironically, because he went to the Royal College of Music, so you know mm. he was talking from a position where yeah. he was exactly. But he was because he was a working class lad from Brentford. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But no, I mean, well, John I, Anderson was isn't he from Rochdale or somewhere like I think that? He's from Accrington. Accrington, right? Yeah. I used to work. Uh, Lorry well, driver. For Accrington, yeah. oh, years ago, when I was an IT manager, we used to work with this company called Zentech. Mm. From up there, I think we're called yeah. Zentech. Well, it's got the word Zen nodding. in it, so yeah. yeah. And uh, the the fellow who ran it, he used to come in all the time, and he was a fucking crazy yes fan. <laughs> yeah. So he used to come to our site just so we could talk about yes, really. Yeah. Um, 
and he used to get his hair cut in, in Accrington <laughs> yeah. from John Anderson's brother, Christ. who's a barber there. Yeah, yeah. But um, he used to say, oh, yeah, yeah, he lost it years ago when he was milking the cows, taking acid <laughs> and all this stuff. And that's what his brother said about yeah, him. But, yeah. you know, to um, for a young lad from that background to just go to London and, you yeah, know, hang yeah. out with, I think the first band he was... Was he in Mabel Greer's tie shop, or was that just John? Uh, I think Chris? that was. I think that was Chris Squire. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that was Chris Squire and Peter Banks. That's right. Who's, yeah. He was the first guitarist. He was in something called Doctor Sin or something, wasn't he? he was in some I stupid John Anderson. Well, there was a band called The Sin, wasn't yeah, there? Yeah, it might have been. Yeah. that. I could be bloody wrong. Yeah, anyway. yeah. I'm usually wrong. Because I know. Um, I think that might have even involved Keith Emerson or something like that. You right. know, again, another. You know. Yeah. Um, it's funny because one of my favourite people in the world and a dear, dear friend is uh, Ian Prowse who never tires of ribbing the shit out of me for being a, a prog fan. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I imagine for anyone, any third parties, it's highly entertaining oh, <laughs> when, I, when, when we get together. You I, know, rem- but... I remember years ago, I went to the Par All <laughs> yeah. when I was about 16, whatever it was, and I was at college, I was at Holton College, we were just doing art and stuff. And I went to see Wakeman with Wakeman, which was Rick and Oh, Adam, yeah, 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 right? yeah. 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 God, this is somebody the other night brought this up. I can't think what it was. Anyway, um, oh, and so afterwards, the girlfriend I had at the time, because I wouldn't shut up about it. <laughs> so she just kind of. You only have to mention them once and they say you don't oh, shut yeah, up about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not fair. Not oh, fair. yeah. Well, she Se- to... Says the long term single man now. <laughs> <laughs> well, she used to call it wanking with women. Because <laughs> she used to just fucking hate it that much. She's like, well, you shut up about this. And I took the program into college. Yeah. And uh, my tutor, who I won't name him now. But mm. we both know him, and he oh, was okay. out the other night. Yeah, oh, and uh, oh the, yeah, the, yeah, the middle yeah. of the, uh, of the thing, <laughs> and in the middle of this program, <laughs> there was Rick opening a fate on the Isle of Man with Fraser Hines, Love it. Yeah. and he was yeah. just like, Fraser, oh I'm fucking rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm thinking, well, Fraser Hines was in Doctrine. That is rock and yeah. roll to me. Yeah. It's funny, though, because all those prog heads, I don't think they realise that they do prog because they, they use the term rock and roll. Or they, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. They're, they're, and you listen to the kind of stuff they're into. Yeah. And they're into bands like, you know, like Peter Gabriel said once when they did Nursery Crime, he said, I, I really want to sound like The Who. And you yeah. just wouldn't have put that sound next to what the who were doing although I suppose if you think of Tommy or something then, then maybe, maybe you know I, I'm just thinking of uh, that album it's fucking great mm. it is wonderful yeah, yeah you know well the other thing that oh again I mean that, I, I remember saying to uh, an eminent Liverpool musician who was tearing into me for this whole thing and he said oh well you're into all that kind of niche stuff and I said this would be the niche when you were playing to 20 people in Ericsson and they were doing the JFK exactly, stadium to, yeah. which you exactly. know it's a bit taboo but I mean they are not without real track records those oh, bands they were filling yeah. so, you know they would tour stadiums yeah well they kind of like invented shows all that, that, that yeah, stadium yeah. rock really the British bands you know Andy Delamere, don't you? Yeah. Well, Andy's managed to get me yeah. listening to Collins' era Genesis right. in the last 12 months. Right. And and I don't actually have anything against Phil Collins. I like Phil Collins. What a drummer. Yeah. And, um, Anyone who says he isn't just doesn't know what well, they're talking exactly. about. The drums. Same as Ringo Starr, you know. Oh, yeah. That's Good, a great drummer. But the guy out of... Have you heard a band called Cardiacs? No. Right, well, they were going years ago. No. Um, great band. Look them oh. up. They invented a, a form of music called Pronk. <laughs> which was prog and punk oh wow oh, and they're brilliant, oh, right. they're brilliant. I'll send you some stuff yeah, I'll send you some yeah. stuff but um, he used to say to me he's like that he said he loved the early you know Collins on mm. the early Genesis records and that and his theory was you, you can hear the beard you can hear it on the microphone <laughs> and um, and you can hear the beard right, you right. know so, so he's got me into listening to it and those um they're great albums that, Trick of the Tale's still, fantastic yeah, and, and yeah. Blood on the Rooftops which is on Wind and Wuthering is, is brilliant. I mean, I think, again, you know, something that I, I even for, from a young person, I always had some kind of antennae for this. And maybe this fits into why you end up doing interviews and, and stuff, is that I remember thinking, when Peter Gabriel left, I mean, I was born in 68, so I, I didn't get it all first time round. I was like seven in, in 1975. But again, when I was getting into like yes and all that kind of thing, um, Seconds Out was an album that my, my friend Trish uh, pl- played to me many, many times. And the version of Supper's Ready on that is magnificent. Oh, yeah. It's absolutely magnificent. Yeah. But I remember thinking even then as a teenager, well, he was the drummer and he has stepped out in front when a band was absolutely at their height, yeah. when the press, their own fan base, 
and probably people within that band thought the departure of Peter Gabriel was like that's it you know yeah over yeah and, <coughs> and I thought to have the bollocks to know that everyone's going to be going well you were doing backing vocals mate you know you can't that is enough for me to admire yeah. him you know yeah. and again I think it's so cheap to take pot shots yeah. at the guy because he was everywhere in the 80s you know yeah. I mean and it, it, he's been quite open about the fact that that sent him into a massive serious depression you know just reading this stuff you know I know you've you've worked with Stephen Fry and it, yeah. it, you know he, he said about the whole cellmate thing he said what kind of person goes home after a show and sits down and thinks I will now break an actor's heart you know or or with Phil Collins a musician you listen to his drumming it's absolutely superb oh, and the irony is one of his most loyal friends and champions to this day is Peter Gabriel. So if they're such, if they're worlds yeah. apart, why do you still make? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck off, get out of yourself. Yeah. Oh, I know, you know I know the Collins bashing. in a band, yeah. But I mean, yeah. <clears throat> One thing that people don't really understand, and it's absolutely true, mm. is that, you know, they auditioned for singers for months. Mm. Phil and, Linnett being one. Yeah, and in the end they just said, well, you're singing all... Mm. Well, you know the story. You're singing mm. all these songs when yeah. people are coming in. Why don't you do it? And he's like, mm. No, no, no. Even though he's, I think, uh, didn't he sing two songs before that? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's one, one on Nursery th Crown. Yeah, and there's one on Foxtrot. Yeah, as well. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the one. You on know, Nursery I need to only been like what 22 or something like that. Yeah, yeah. At the time, you know. So again, I mean, just to join that band as a drummer was a big deal. Yeah. To then front it. Yeah, because he was. He would have probably still been the new boy, wouldn't he? Well, it, the he's not on um, the one that the, the it's knife not on the first on. one. They didn't have a drummer, yeah. did they? That's yeah, that's right. And then on Trespass, he's not on either, is he? Uh, is that the one with the blue cover with yeah. the knife? Yeah, no, he's not on that. No, uh, he's on Nursery Crime, then Foxtrot, yeah. um, Selling Sellings, and then the Lamb, and then yeah, the East, yeah. The, you know, all systems go after there, you know amazing bloody albums they yeah. really are I don't give a shit I will they can they can lock me up for liking this stuff I don't <laughs> give a fuck it's just too bloody good yeah and well I, if they did lock it up you'd just listen to it well, all. Would. you'd have longer to well, listen that's the good thing about being uh, getting older now and getting to this age you don't even need the records anymore you want to hear it you just it's there tune into yeah. your head and you yeah. can listen to yeah. it you know yeah I mean I, I, I think looking back you know the, we're talking about an era you know that is now like not far short of 50 years ago you know yeah. and it's amazing when you see those people i mean i i saw kate bush live um and she was she was incredible you know and i thought you know you i, I was like i think i would have been seven or something when mother and Heights came out yeah what was it 75 was it or 74 78 it was oh 78 that. okay so a bit older than nine yeah but still to, to go and see her as a middle-aged man she's still yeah you know i know she didn't tour you know, you know, but she's still been a yeah. incredibly significant recording artist. Well, you know? I'd have been four or five when that Wuthering Nights come out, and I remember it. I, oh, I yeah. do remember yeah, it, and I'm trying to remember who was who was the comedian who who did the piss take of it. Who would oh, that I don't have been? Know. I don't know. I remember that really well. It's, it as it sounds well. like something. Can he ever? I know Pamela Stevenson like did it. It must but, be Pamela Stevenson. Yeah. I'm thinking. Yeah, Stevenson. Yeah, I think that was might have been Babushka, but I'm not. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, I don't know she was, yeah. I mean, she was easy pickings, wasn't she? Because of the really high voice. Yeah, yeah. But again, yeah. that that was a massive thing for me. You know, reading the sleeve notes and reading the lyrics. There's all these references. You know, Wuthering Nice is only one of many of her stuff that references literature. You know, obviously, yeah. um, Sensual World yeah. is, is Ulysses. You know, and right. you know, it, it just made me. It, I, I felt like, and I know I'm vanishing up my own backside here but it just felt like all these great art forms were talking to each other so yeah. you'd hear a fantastic song I worked with her drummer as well Stuart Elias who was an absolutely lovely guy yeah. um, and you know you'd, you'd, you'd hear but part of your brain is going towards what is just a fantastic bass line or a great piano part like Man With A Child In His Eyes is one of yeah. the great along with Bridge Over Troubled Water you know it's just because the song's so haunting and the vocal is so overpowered in, in its own way yeah that you don't tend to pay attention to what she's actually doing on the keys, and it's it's astonishing. You yeah, know? yeah. Really tight little chord progressions that are beautiful. And the you videos know. were fantastic as well. Yeah, yeah. What's the one where she's on fucking roller skates? Are there all on roller skates oh, with pointy hats? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sat in your lap. God, like that's <laughs> not only an amazing. Like, I mean, you hear that now; mm, it'd sound mm, mm. innovative. Yeah, but coupled with the sort of 
artistic sensibility that's in mm. that video. And that, well, that whole album, I mean, that's off the dreaming. Right. And uh, there's a great song on that that's almost like has got an earlier sound. It's only a fourth album, but there's a song on that called Houdini. And again, I I was just I mean I love I don't want to sort of sound like I've only got one sort of taste here because you play me the opening to Daydream Believer by the Monkeys and I'm anyone's I'm yeah. a massive fan of the Hollies you know yeah. but I love Elvis Costello so much is that he is able to synthesize all, all these kind of different sounds you know yeah but with Kate Bush to hear a song a three minute song but that is about Houdini the magician, you know, was just like this is amazing. Do you yeah. know what I mean? it? It a true coming together of the the two things I love the most. Yeah. When, when I hear stuff like that, you know, and yeah. when she did the Ninth Wave, and uh, you know, you, 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 even her last album, which Stephen Fry's on. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. I think replacing Vivian Stanshall, it's the kind of yeah. thing that would yeah. had Vivian Stanshall been alive, absolutely, he'd have been. Well, he's Surely. always always going to be missed. It would appear on this landscape that we have, isn't he, Viv? I mean, no oh. one, no one can, uh, no one can seem to get over appreciating him. Every generation seems, thankfully, to appreciate. It just shows you that quality mm. can persist, and it's it does leave the question that I mean, Tony Wilson said that any generation that listens to the Perrett's records is a dead generation, didn't he? I mean, he was a known cynic, mm, so, yeah, so he's going to yeah. say something like that. And he probably then added, uh, and so buy some of the ones I'm selling, mm. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, but yeah. Um, it does. It, I don't. I don't see too much. But then I'm, you know, not the core demographic as they call it these days. No, but I, I, I think that. I mean, maybe that possibly might have been to do with the, the time at which he he got. I think the film Twenty Four Hour Party people shows that era for yeah. the, the sort of brilliantly creative chaos but chaos nonetheless it was it wasn't like you know like the hip factory or somewhere where there was this very tight system or the brill building in new york you know and and some absolutely brilliant music came out of that but i think now if you're if you're now 20 obviously you've got so many more reference points when glenn campbell died you know i had students who were like singing Wichita Lineman and quoting his stuff or knew that he'd been a great guitar player you know again uh, uh, you know this is a man who in one year alone appeared on 700 recordings how phenomenal is that you know what I mean it's crazy and now we've 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 got that time to look back on but you're absolutely right someone like Viv Stanshaw will always stride above all that because he's just so you know as an outsider you you spent half the time trying to work him out, but it's still attractive at the same yeah, time. Yeah. Do you think that? Do you think Peter Cook will survive in that way? I don't know because, because with Peter Cook, so much of his output was television, and so much of it's gone, mm. and so much of it is kind of locked away, really, in that in that sort of monochromatic, mm. you know, thing. People seem to have no kind of persistence when it comes to. Either things not being in colour or things yeah. not. But I mean, what Viv did because of the medium, even though it was like, you know, mind you, vinyl's coming back now, isn't it? But even though the um, method of delivery differed, and now we've got iPhones and shit like that, it's still the same kind of product, isn't it? You can put your earphones in and have a, uh, you can have that headphones experience with what Viv created because what Viv created was very much about taking the listener on a journey. It was very. Radio Four, but not. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, sort of subverting yeah. all of that. Yeah. So with with Peter Cook, um, I don't know. You don't. You sort of. You listen to. I listen to Derek and Clive now, and this is like heresy, really. But a lot of it sort of makes me quite uncomfortable, to be quite honest. Yeah, um, yeah I agree with that. Um, so with Peter Cook, I think that a lot of his work seems to. There's bit, seems to be a lot of bitterness in there. Seems to be a mm. lot of bitterness, um, and a lot of it he's sort of uh, screaming at the world. Really, um, Viv seems to always have his own universe to just go back to. I mean, the Rawlinson End world. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've always often thought it was his coping mechanism to just deal with the world. Right. Because it is so well fleshed out. When you start, oh, it's like Alice in Wonderland, isn't yes, it? You know, yeah, it's, it's yeah. its own universe. Yeah. yeah, and and you can you can feel the sort of wallpaper sort of peeling off the walls in the corners. I this bet if some animator house. develops a game yeah. based on yeah. it, 
Yeah, that'd be fantastic. It. And it's the actors around to supply the voices. And yeah, yeah, some yeah. of them are still. Well, I worked with Sheila Reed, who, who was a, a part, right. a part yeah. of all that. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the thing, sadly, although it was it was it was just, it must have been electrifying at the time. What Peter Cook was brilliant at was responding yeah. to. Well, that Clive Anderson talks back. Brilliant. It's fucking, it's great, isn't mm. it? I mean, that is just so... The one I remember from it, <laughs> <laughs> there's so many moments in it, but there's one where uh, he's in it. What is he? Um, what? The football manager's Alan, Alan Latchley. Alan, Alan, Latchley. <laughs> Alan Latchley is just a load. Motivation, motivation, uh, motivation. Three motivation. M's. <laughs> 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 but one of my favourite lines in it is oh. the... Um, I can't think of his name, but there's a rock star one on it. And I can't think oh, of Oh, God, called. it's Eric someone, isn't it? Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I can't think of the name. Yeah. But he says, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah, Clive. I, you know, I've just, I've just, I've just got out of the Henry Ford clinic, and he's yeah, like, yeah. I'm sure that you mean the Betty Ford <laughs> yeah, clinic. Yeah, yeah. No, Henry Ford. Uh, the, you have to build a car <laughs> yeah, before yeah, they let yeah, you yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a much tougher yeah. regime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And and you know, for an ad lib. Yeah. It's well, it's the judge as well. You know, the judge of that one. But he says, uh, Clive Anderson says to him, you had a very strong sense of right and wrong, even as a youngster. He goes, Well, I hanged a boy at school. <laughs> <laughs> he he'd taken some toffees that I was convinced were mine. Oh, you know? wonderful! And I think when um, you can only imagine what it must have been like to be there when he did the Jeremy Thorpe thing. You know, the oh, uh, the judge yeah. the summing yeah, up because yeah. both of my parents had uh, uh, said, you know, the 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 feeling at the time. You know, you had this politician who was kind of tipped. For, I mean, he had Foreign Office written all over him and all that. I mean, he's he was going to be he, prime he, minister. He was a party leader. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, and it was so interestingly what we said however long ago it was about Boris Johnson it was so establishment in the way that there was just this sense of nothing can defeat me and this arrogance and the judge yeah. absolutely turned the jury against I mean I thought the thing that was on quite recently you know with Ben Whishaw yes, I thought yeah, that was brilliant that was brilliant Hugh Grant was superb and yeah. he was really yeah. again another person who yeah. people like to take pot shots at and you go well he's he, he's, he's, act, he's acting actor. everyone off yeah he's great he's absolutely great but he avoids all those pitfalls doesn't he there's so many traps for mm. actors in the jobs that he does, and he just sort of he nimbly, yeah, yeah, just goes around and yeah, yeah. hats off to him. Yeah, you know, and I, I think you know for for Peter Cook, his his strength was if something like that happened, he was satirising it. Yeah. Uh, apparently that came out of a bad review that a reviewer said, "Oh, satire's finished." And, oh really? Yeah, because they did the Secret Policeman's Ball. They did it over three nights, right? And the press were in on the first night, so the reviews came out the second right. morning. And he, Peter Cook got panned, said, oh, he just went through all his old greatest hits and all that kind of thing. So he wrote that sketch in the afternoon. Wow. And the judges summing up had happened the day before. So that audience was seeing something so unbelievably wow. immediate, you know. And there's, it was really well filmed, that one, because they keep cutting away to the audience. And yeah. you can see this mixture of, like, <laughs> they're finding it hilarious, but they can't believe that it's actually, no. you know, that he is no. disgracing the establishment kind of in front of itself. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? But well, didn't Billy Conley give him the line about uh, a player of the pink hole? Yeah, or something? yeah, yeah. And, and do you know what he said about that? He, he said he he added self confessed, and he said and that was just perfect. That's it. it That's it. I knew there was scared. a little twist he'd put yeah. on it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's it's just stuff like that just shows you his genius. I'll tell you what's really good. The Chris Morris stuff. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what one of the things that uh, if you've not seen it, I'll I'll mm. give you a copy of. There's a thing called Weekend in Wallop. It's a sort of prototype for um, comic relief. Oh, okay. And uh, I gave Arthur Smith a, co a copy yeah. of it because he was just like, oh, I'd love to see it. And I was like, yeah. oh, I've got it if you want it. Yeah. Anyway, in that, um, Peter Cook and Mel Smith are a double act. Oh, wow. Oh, it's yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And for some reason, they've got shower caps on their head. No, swimming caps <laughs> on their head, the two of them. Yeah. And Cook's just got a fag in his hand and a pint, and Mel Smith's got a pint in his yeah. hand. And it's like that. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we are lesbians. <laughs> and then they launch into this thing. It's like that. Yeah. The moment I saw Mel, yeah. I knew that's the woman for me. <laughs> that's the woman I want in my life. The sort of woman who could stop a car with her bare hand. Mm. And then Mel goes, I only hailed a cab. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I wonder. Do you think maybe that's where Fry and Laurie got the... Do you remember the Fry and Laurie sketch where Hugh Laurie's a high court judge again? And he, um, the, Stephen Fry is a, a barrister, but is pushing that he's, he's obsessed with the idea that the client is lesbian. And at one point, Hugh, Hugh Laurie just intervenes and he goes, 
Am I to imply from the tenor of your thrusts that I am a lesbian? <laughs> and and he, he says, no, he says, well, I hope so. I hope the day is very far removed when I could ever be accused of making love to a woman. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And you're like, oh, man, oh, you yeah. rug out every biff now. But I wonder if that was because obviously Maybe. they're big P- Peter Cook fans. Well, that was uh, at the end of the sketch. It's so, like, because they're just like these fat, pissed men. <laughs> and he's like that. Yes, we are lesbians and uh, we would like to invite any lesbians who may be here and then Mel's like young, yeah, young yeah, yeah, yes yeah, yeah, young yeah, yeah. beautiful to join us yeah <laughs> that's what he was so good at Peter Cook because you always you could always see what was underneath it couldn't yeah. you you could always see the, the other points he was making yeah. you know yeah I, I just I, I, I miss that hearing him and Chris Morris riff a, oh, against each yeah, other yeah. Was, was brilliant yeah they, apparently they recorded that why bother why bother yeah, yeah yeah almost the last thing he did which became the Clive Anderson that's it um, I think they were both done about Things maybe. Things great as well. The Twelve Days of Christmas. Have you seen that? No. With Ludovic Kennedy. Oh. No. And he does them all like five minute chunks. Right. And he did one and they put out one a night on BBC Two every night over right. Twelve Days of Christmas, and it's um, with Sir Arthur Greeb. Oh yeah. You know, yeah, and, it's yeah. Like, and he's he's brilliant in that, and, right. and he does the Twelve Days. And I, can't, I, I don't even want to try and remember it. Mm, mm. You know, obviously, I'll, you can have a copy of it, and it's great. It's really it, well. It's great. funny because that because that reminds me of um, the one of the inside number nines was called the Twelve Days of Christine, and that was Sheridan right. Smith. As you know, and I was just thinking then those those two in particular, but the League of Gentlemen in in general. I guess they're the nearest we've got to that sort of Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, slightly yeah. surreal, very intellectual, but. Also, very good at doing complete bass humour as well. Oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, they, they, they're just the way they are able to marry the macabre and, mm. and the humour is incredible. I, did you, Ghost Stories has just come out on DVD, hasn't it? I didn't see the film, but I saw it on stage. Right. Um, and again, yeah, that, that was absolutely fantastic. Yeah. There you go. That You don't realise how difficult that genre is to, to really. Ca- I mean, oh, Black, yeah. Black Mirror does it. Really yeah, well, I think. Yeah, yeah. As well, yeah. including when it went over to Netflix. I mean, I don't know yeah. a lot of people sort of, you know, it's just such a typical thing to say that it lost its authenticity. Well, it didn't because Charlie Brooker's still writing them all. Yeah, you know, it's um, a fantastic one of those where the, it's all about your social media score. Yeah, yeah. Fuck, yeah. We're getting there now. Absolutely, we're getting there. China are introducing some kind of system whereby if you haven't got enough social credit, yeah, you know. You can't do this. You can't do that. It's well, the one with the mechanical dog has oh, has quite quickly. You know, yeah. I mean, that, that's like pure. So that's like those kind of eerie sixties. There yeah. was that one, the Signal Man. You yeah. Know, the, the, oh those yeah, kinda, that's great. Yeah. The, those kind of things, but um, no, I, I I thought with Black Mirror, I I kind of I, I I always get a little bit confused when when people say you know that thing about oh television it was so much better in you can pick any era we are we're living through a, f- a fairly great era now mm. actually yeah i think you know well, they forget I'm... the shit it's like thinking, yeah. remembering when you were a kid and you just remember the sunny days don't you you know yeah you yeah. know people just remember the dad's armies and then they forget you know um what's what's some of that i saw fucking my, my, my job language oh, right yeah. but i mean yeah. real rubbish with yeah. arthur mullard and uh and yeah. queenie watts yos my dear yeah yeah and there's there's some rubbish <laughs> yos, I, my dear. yos my dear well that's because he could say the word yos in a, in, yeah. a, in a mildly funny way it was like my, my mate liam said to me years ago we were talking about uh, percy edwards you know when percy oh, yeah. edwards died and you know we were two actors trying to get any kind of work you you know, imagine that in those days, I can make a noise like a sparrow. Have a fourteen part series, oh, yeah, yeah. You know for what fifty I mean? years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, they got away with bloody murder <laughs> yeah. then. They really did get away yeah. with bloody murder. Yeah. Um, Although, when you think of what's been lost, I mean, I know you mentioned before about Peter Cook, so much of his stuff has gone. You know, to think that there were Stepto episodes that were wiped yeah. because the tapes were a resource. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, are it's, you it's, kidding? It's a, you know? Well, thankfully, the authors got an engineer to run them off early domestic VHS is up well yeah it's called Shibadden the, the right. format yeah um and so you, the copies of every step toll exist Brilliant. so there's nothing missing yeah. but the first two seasons in color are missing a, a, a the majority of the color episodes mm. um I could really bore you with this and I'm no not, no I'm not I'm, going I, to I, I bet you don't no no it's just that they've managed to get the color out a lot of um you remember Telecine? Where they used to point a film camera because there's so many TV oh, yeah. formats yeah. in the world. Yeah. They point a film camera at uh, a monitor playing the video, mm. but this film camera, because of the nature of the uh, material, the media, <clears throat> was 
was able to capture chroma dots. And now they've come up with a process whereby they can use those chroma dots, feed them through a computer, no and those chroma dots give you the colour information. Wow. For the, it's fucking crazy, wow. isn't yeah, it? Yeah. But it's not possible with the steptones because they were done right. straight to a, a video recorder. Um, but yeah, I mean, the thing is that with equity back then, if you repeated a program, it cost more than making a new one. Hmm. The tapes were five grand each. Five grand, really? In the oh 60s. My God. You had license fee payers complaining about the, you know what you're spending this on and what you're spending on that on, and then storing the bloody things. Yeah. So you know that it does become okay, and there was no prospect of home, uh, yeah. VHS or anything. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I, it bugs me too the amount of stuff. I mean, the amount of um, till death us do part that are gone mm. is is you know really because yeah, there's yeah. there's a great illustration. Of erring every view you've got, no matter how repugnant or no matter how oh, yeah. uh, you know away with the furries if you're a Absolutely. utopian like my and having a good old fucking ding dong, yeah, and getting yeah, it all out of the way. Yeah, I got people talking, you know what I mean. I think that again, that this is where people don't sort of get it that it's okay to explore that kind of territory in comedy because had Dennis Potter done that, yeah. people would have thought, oh, well, here he goes being controversial again. But there wouldn't have been anything like the outcry. Yeah. It wasn't really until the eighties that public opinion, t or it wasn't really public opinion, opinion, professional opinion, turned against Dennis Potter and started mm -hmm. withdrawing his work. You know what I mean? Yeah. He was able to have those arguments yeah. because it was really serious when you put yeah. it into comedy and suddenly it's not legitimate ground. Yeah. But you're yeah. all right, you know, I mean, yeah. you know the, the Tony Booth character and oh, that, yeah. that allowed them to have yeah. that discussion. Yeah. It's you know. great. It's great stuff. Yeah. What, what survives is fantastic. Yeah. There's a great line in Steptoe when... Um, and again, this was, I, I would have been really young when I saw this, but it was a big awakening in terms of the potential of comedy, which is, do you remember the episode where they find a, a What the Butler Saw machine, yeah. which is like early porn, yeah. you know? And obviously the twist is that it's the old guy yeah. who's in the thing. And he says, right at the end of the episode, he says to his son, he says, oh, you, you didn't mind watching it when you didn't know it was me. Yeah. He said, well, you know the person you thought it was, that's someone's father as well. Yeah. And he said, you know the women, they're someone's daughter. Yeah. That was social commentary as good as it gets. Oh, yeah. As good as it gets. But I mean, you know? he, he goes further in that where he says uh, that they were bathing, it was Auntie Lowe's, and yeah. they were bathing her in milk. Yeah. Right? And he said, You don't know what it was like, Harold. It was during the Depression. I got to take the leave overs of the milk home with me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's all kinds of, of stuff like that in there that, yeah. um, that went right under the radar and mm. hits home every time. I mean, some of the stepped on. Oh, it's incredible. The first one, there's not even a laugh for about 10 or 15 minutes. Mm. And then when he's trying to push the car because he can't have the horse that, yeah. and he's crying. Yeah. And I think it's Ray Galton said, he said, Jesus Christ, he's crying because they used to work yeah. with Tony Hancock. And, yeah, yeah. And yeah. comedians. And yeah. It's like, oh, we're yeah. working with an actor. Yeah, it was like watching like Oedipus or something. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. I love that. And I, I, I think because there have been so many giants upon whose shoulders people can now stand you know I, I i love being in this era of people like steve coogan and, yeah. and ricky gervais who you know um I, I can now push stuff you know steve coogan's film philomena um, yeah, yeah 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 how on earth you know and i mean it's a, you wouldn't really call it a comedy film but there is comedy in it and i yeah. just love it that we no longer stick that label as we probably would have done with wilfred bramble or, or, yeah. i mean obviously steve coogan's different because he, he's a writer and a producer and, and clearly has a formidable if not a great mind for everything you know i mean yeah. it's it, it squared enough to the press and all that he's been he's been yeah. superb and all that kind of thing you know but it's it's great having had all that that those people can now it's now legitimate within comedy yeah. to pull it right back yeah. and have somebody die or have somebody get Alzheimer's or, yeah. or whatever or yeah. in the case of Philomena obviously you know the disgraceful treatment of, of young women by the Catholic Church yeah. you couldn't have got that film made in the 60s no it is it's it is incredible to think how recent it all is you know mm. I mean even in my own case because my mum wasn't married when I was born mm. my granddad made me um made her get rid of me at three days old and you know i was off to the orphanage and really? stuff like that yeah. and that's 1972 yeah so it just shows you i mean my nan went and got me back and i use it as part of my stand-up now so right you know right. it's just like oh yeah so i spent that first christmas <laughs> deprived of the bonding experience of breastfeeding i spent the first christmas <laughs> alone and flat on my back with a bottle in my mouth 
I spend most Christmas. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you, you know. So, so that's the way to use all that yeah. stuff. But it is, it is very, very recent that, that yeah. attitudes like that were. Well, um, I, I was born the year after. Uh, you know, the year before I was born, it was still against the law to be gay. Yeah. It was against it. Was like. Prosecutable offence. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? The year Mind before, you, Stephen that's Fry. That's the year Magical Mystery Tour came out. Yeah, yeah. the year of Sergeant Pepper. Yeah. Well, Stephen Fry says uh, that the old boys say to him, "Of course, it's not as much fun now. It's legal." Yeah. <laughs> so whether that's right. true or not, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. What was Ed Emerson like then? I mean, what? Oh, he's fucking great. I'd love to interview him. Yeah, yeah. He's one of the people, you know, because yeah. occasionally people will say, "Who would you like to?" Yeah, and I've always thought with him because, again, on a personal level, he's had an interesting deal, hasn't he? But being so close to Rick Mayall and being married to Jennifer Saunders. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, did you ever see that thing he did where he was playing? Uh, it was about the Chernobyl disaster, and it was a straight to camera hour long no. monologue. No, yeah, it was a true story about one of the scientists who had predicted that it would happen. Right, and had tried to make people aware and was dealing with guilt that perhaps he should have gone further but he had put it on record and said look right. you know, this is going to blow and it will be a disaster second only to the atom bomb right um and Ed Edmonton did this incredible bbc it's got to be on youtube or, or something like oh, that and oh. most of it is him just looking right down the lens talking and i remember watching thinking you are like another level oh he's great isn't he i mean his performances are great I enjoyed that War and Peace that they put on the other mm. year, the BBC. I mean, it was very truncated, but I still mm. enjoyed it, you know. Yeah, yeah. All I think about whenever I think about Chernobyl is the fucking, the joke when we were kids, Chernobyl fall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it just yeah. always yeah. just, because I'm so pure. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mike, I could and chat all oh. night, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I could chat all night about this rubbish that uh, is in our heads. So could I, and that's it's why you shouldn't have got me in. <laughs> Wonderful fun. We shall do it again. Love to, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. See you tomorrow. <laughs> Cheers, Mike. Nice one. Thank See you, you later. Ta-da. <laughs>